This meeting is being recorded. All right, well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. I am Dr. Felicia Durden, and it's a pleasure to have you all here as we go over Lorraine Hansberry's A Raisin in the Sun, um, her beautiful play um, that was written in 1958. Um, there have been a lot of movies um, and television specials about this um, book, but on the cover of it, it says, one of a handful of great American plays it belongs in the inner circle along with Death of a Salesman, Long Day's Journey into Night, and The Glass Menagerie. And that was from the Washington Post. And I would concur. And I love drama. So um, I think it's one of the most well-written plays um, of our time. So we wanted to definitely give it um, some, some time. All right. So a little bit about Lorraine Hansberry. Um, Lorraine Hansberry was born in May 19th of 1930, and she passed away January 12th of 1965. Um, this play is based off of something that happened in her own life. In 1938, her father um, bought a house in an all-white neighborhood in Chicago um, called Washington Park, um, and it was a big to-do um, with that. So there is some personal reflection um, in, her, in her play. Um, the Hansberry family, they were prominent figures. Um, they socialized with all the big names like W.B. Du Bois, Langston Hughes. So they were a family that was really prominent in, their, in the Black community um, during the 50s. Um, in, the in 1950, Lorraine moved to New York City because she wanted to become a writer. Um, so she moved to pursue her writing career. And she was hired in 1951 at the black newspaper called The Freedom. Um, she was a very, uh, I would say opinionated and uh, she was a figure who um, stood up for what she believed in. And so she supported the Daughters of Bilitis, which was a lesbian rights group, which was not something that was very popular um, back in the 1950s, but she saw a need to support what she felt was right. And she was also, and I think this is really important, the first African-American woman playwright to have her play performed in Broadway. So that's a huge accomplishment. Um, she did die at 34. As we see, she had a very short lifespan of pancreatic cancer. Um, unfortunately, um, she is no longer with us. But I wanna show a quick video clip about Lorraine. It is only here on paper that I dare say it like that. My work, all which I feel I must write has become obsessive. So many truths seem to be rushing at me as a result of things felt and seen and lived through. Oh, what I think I must tell this world. The process of writing a play is really different for every playwright. Some playwrights begin with an idea, and some playwrights begin with characters that just insist that their stories be told. I'm going to write a social drama about Negroes that will be good art, Lorraine told her husband. She wanted to focus on the working class. She wanted them to be in struggle against racial discrimination. And she wanted them to come through struggle and to make some kind of heroic choice. Hansberry drew on the lives and the personalities she grew up with on the south side of Chicago for her drama. She struggled to find the words to capture their hopes, dreams, and frustrations. Bob didn't rebuke me at all except with a look. He just got down on the floor and picked up every sheet of it. He put it back in order and kept the whole thing out of my sight for several days. 
And then one night when I was moping around, he got it out and put it in front of me. I went to work and finished it. So um, that's just a really short insight of how she had truly given up on writing this, this play, um, as many great um, writers get to that point with their work where they're just not sure. Um, but we're so happy that she listened to her husband and went ahead and finished one of the, I think, best plays um, of our time by a female um, writer. Um, like I said, there's our connections to real life in Hansberry's um, book, or I don't want to call it her play, her play. Um, her father was a wealthy real estate broker in Chicago, and they purchased that home, as we talked about. Um, but the backlash of that was that um, the Hansberry appealed to the Supreme Court of Illinois. And that case of Hansberry et al. versus Lee et al. goes all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States on October 25th of 1940. And the U.S. Supreme Court deems restrictive covenants non-existent. And that was a decision that opened up 500 new homes to race. So that's why we can see how it was so important for her to get this story out there. It was her story. Um, it was about her family and about many African-Americans who are trying to get to a better home, better areas, better neighborhoods for their families and their children. Um, Hansberry wanted to get that written and get that out there in her play. And she did a phenomenal job in it. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the Great Migration, um, housing in Chicago. So during, from 1916 to 1970, there were more than 6 million African-Americans moving from the rural South to big cities like Chicago. They were looking for a better life. We know they went to New York and, and other places, but Chicago was also one of those um, cities where um, Blacks from the South went to find a better life. My family is from DeKalb, Mississippi in um, Tem Kemper County, very small in Mississippi. And I have an aunt um, who moved to Chicago um, for a better life. So we, we moved to Arizona. Um, my grandma moved to Arizona, um, Iowa. But Chicago was one of those big cities that many Southern Blacks moved to. Um, but because of that, many Chicago neighborhoods formed those restrictive covenants that Hansberry um, fought against, which legally made it binding contracts that specified that an owner could not rent to or sell to a Black person in those neighborhoods. But even after those contracts were ruled illegal, banks, brokers, neighborhood organizations, and violent racists resisted the integration. They just did not want that. So housing in Chicago um, is a is whole study of its own that we could even um, spend time on, but it was really important to understand the background um, of what happened with Hansberry and her family in the story, but also in her own life. So this is what a Chicago slum would have looked like in the 1950s. So very crowded, not good housing conditions, not good health conditions. Look at all that smoke and right there, the trains right there, uh, right by their home. That's affecting their, um, their quality of air, air quality, um, not to mention the noise pollution and just the over um, running of people so close to each other just so you can see what it would have possibly looked like in the 1950s in a Chicago slum. So then that gets us to the civil rights movement, um, which is also pertinent with what we're going to be discussing in the book tonight. Um, in 1948, there was Executive Order 9981, which ended segregation in the United States military. It started there. Then we know about Brown versus the Board of Education in 54. That ended segregation in public schools, Ruby Bridges. Then 1955, Emmett Till, which he's, thank goodness, coming back to light. There's a lot of um, things in the news. And there was a great uh, special um, on PBS about him. Um, a 14-year-old from Chicago 
who was brutally murdered in Mississippi for allegedly flirting, actually whistling um, at a white woman. In 1955, Rosa Parks was defiant and that prompted the Montgomery bus boycotts. 1957, we had the Little Rock Nine. That was the fight to integrate those Little Rock Central High School. In 1957, we had the Civil Rights Act, which helped to protect the voting rights of Blacks. And right in the middle of that, 1959, our play debuted on Broadway, A Raising the Sun. Um, 1961, the Freedom Riders began protesting throughout the South. And in 63, Dr. King delivered his beautiful I Have a Dream speech. So we can see where our play, a lot of things were impacting um, Blacks. And during that time, Hansberry's play came out. Oops. So it opened on March 11th in 59. And the cast was out of sight. Something to really look at. Sidney Poitier, Claudia McNeil, Ruby D. I mean, some of the best um, actors and actresses, Black actors and actresses were cast in this play. Um, in 59, the New York drama critics named it the best American play. And it ran for nearly two years on Broadway. And then it was made into that film that many of you have probably seen that starred most of the Broadway cast in 1961. Truly one of the um, plays that I always enjoy watching. I never get tired of watching A Raisin in the Sun. There was a remake of it with um, Felicia Rashad from The Cosby Show and Puff Daddy. I don't know if he's going by that name now. Sean Puffy Combs, whatever he's calling himself these days. He was in that movie as well. And that was beautiful too. I enjoyed that rendition. But the Sidney Poitier one with Ruby D. That's the one, I, and Claudia McNeil. That is a wonderful rendition of Hansberry's play. All right, we're getting through the background. So why does this play matter? You know, we've heard from the Washington Post, they called it um, a great American play and that it belonged on that inner circle. Um, we also know that it ran for the two years and it was named one of the best plays. But why is it important? Why does it matter? Critics say it can be considered a turning point in American art and drama because it addressed so many important issues during the 50s in the United States. Um, Hansberry created the Younger Family, one of the first honest depictions of a Black family on an American stage um, in this play. So that was also important. Hold on one second, you guys. All right. And the play was also prefaced. If we could open up our books, if you have them. And let's preface it. It's with um, Langston Hughes. Beautiful poem. And I'll read that. It says, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? So it's prefaced by Langston Hughes poem. How do you think the play would illustrate the theme of this poem? And here's, it's called Harlem by Langston Hughes, here it is here. How do you guys think um, the theme of the play is summarized? Because she put it here for a reason in the poem. Well, I can say that dreams never die. There's always hope for dreams to come true in different ways. For this family, the mother had her dream, the son, had his dream. The young girl had her dream uh -huh. going to school, becoming a nurse. The son wanting to be a independent businessman. But I think it's the mother who is much like um, a, the dreamer wanting to be, uh -huh. uh, wanting to be, uh, um, 
well, like mothers, better life for their children, a better life for her and her family. I think for the mother, it wasn't so much wanting to use the money that was there for her in a, in a negative way for her, right. the, the money was the dream. She saw it as a dream, as an opportunity to, to get out of the neighborhood. And I think it wasn't so much money the way that I see it. It wasn't so much the money that was evil. I think it was just the living conditions that all of the members of the family felt that they needed to get away from. And money was just the way to do it. Yes, yes. But everybody had a different idea of what they needed the money for. They never agreed, but it was the mother who always kept her family together with her dream, which was more important. Right, right. Moving, moving out of there. She had a chance to move away. And that was the way to do it. So, Beautiful. so I think uh, for me, it was um, the dream deferred. I don't think it was a deferred dream because in the end they did move. So it was a question that we all ask ourselves growing up and having a family or being part of a large family. Everybody has a dream of wanting to be do better, mm -hmm. uh, be, become better, to, to dream big. Uh, and that's what parents always want is for their children to dream big and go to school, have, a, have an education. Everybody uh, had a dream. Everyone. But uh, you know what I think is important, Professor, is no one really asked each other what is your dream? Mm -mm. No. It was just the mother who mm -hmm. made it clear what her dream was. Right. Because she saw beyond what that dream, what that move could mean for them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And, and you know what? We never really, really know. In the end, we hope uh -huh. the dream came true. We really don't know. No. Uh -huh. uh, and she didn't intend for us to know. She kept that ambiguity there. Right. <laughs> so don't you love it? <laughs> okay. You always end up saying, well, I hope they made it. Yep. We hope they made it. We're rooting for them. Yep. Thank you. Someone mm -hmm. else. Thank you, Chris. It's great. Mm -hmm. I like to give my opinion. Please, Ms. Ruth. Of the poem, because the poem really describe the conditions of the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that I think he did a very good job of describing how things were at yeah. that time and Lorraine had picked it up and tried to make it look better mm -hmm. than what it was and what it was does it dry it, up? Mm -hmm. it was a it was a dirty time. It was a, as the picture showed, it was yeah. very, very dark and very clouded. And yes, it was a lot of frustration going on at that time. Yes. And I think that's how that poem mm -hmm. brought out the condition of Lorraine's play. Beautiful, beautiful. She, she wanted to. She dreamed that things would be better. She did. Than what he had described. Yes. Thank you, Miss Ruth. Beautiful. Another. I noticed in um, just Act One, what caught my attention really quickly was when she was setting the tone for the house that they lived yeah. in. Mm -hmm. weariness has in fact won in this room mm -hmm. and just so accurately depicting even if there's hope there's also such a strong presence of weariness yeah. that's always a battle and you see this from even the, the scramble to use the bathroom and the scramble to deal with whether or not the little boy can get 50 cents to go yeah. to school don't talk about money we don't do that that makes us tired before we start our day it's like the tone was set so beautifully Right. Show, um, how what they're fighting against, and uh, she did it so well. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful. Is there another? Uh, Dr. Durden, the, uh, I agree with all that's been said. But one of the things that really stood out to me was the behavior of the husband. 
and the relationship between he and the wife. And I, I, I don't know exactly how the mother could have helped him to act better, but I, it was just all throughout, I, I felt sorry for the relationship that was between the two of them and how she was looking at the pregnancy. It was just like such a, a disturbing situation to me. And then when he uh, took the money and went off and gave all of it to Willie, instead of putting the 3000 in the, the bank for the daughter, his sister, like the mother had uh, instructed him to do, I just felt like he was just out of control in terms of wanting something for himself. And I, I didn't think he was really working hard to try and change his situation. He's, he continued to drink and, and, and run around with those guys that they were just in the streets, it appears. And so I, I thought it was a real stressful time. And, but then in the end, I thought, all right, maybe they'll get it together. You know, um, in terms of blacks moving into neighborhoods, I remember back around 1967 or so, my husband's family lived in St. Louis. His mother uh, and his sister, they had always lived in duplexes. And the sister decided to, to get a house. Mm -hmm. And she found one out in the, the county. And the, the street that she moved on to was all white. She was the only black on there. And after she moved onto the street, the street became probably 75% black because they, they all moved and got sold their property and all. And um, at the time I thought, wow, I wonder how did she feel moving on the, the street? Things weren't, it didn't seem in, in a, a big disarray, but we knew that racial issues were there in St. Louis, okay? Uh, but um, she had a job with the civil service. She, she made a career working on a civil service job. So she had a nice income and all, but it was like the people just started moving off of that street and so her sister was uh, fortunate enough that she was able to buy the house next door to her when the people in that house moved out. <coughs> so the family sort of stayed together with <coughs> sister and her son and, and my mother-in-law and her son. But the people were just moving like crazy when they first moved in there. And so when I uh, was reading this and I thought about, wow, Mm hmm you know it's like I came from Mississippi mm -hmm. and I came from an all-black town so we didn't have people uh running out the neighborhood uh, if somebody moved and all but this this like really brought it home and yes. I thought wow they lived under such stressful stressful times uh a lot of it created by the, the by them yeah, so true. I, although, although the daughter was able to go to school. Yes, yes, that's true. She was able to uh, think about having an education and moving on. And mm -hmm. she probably didn't want to marry her boyfriend, but he was part of her dream in a different way. She had the choice probably later of moving up, if you want to look at it that way, by marrying him, even though he was from Nigeria. Maybe they would have gone back, I don't know. But if you look at the daughter with her dream of going to school and the mother wanting to use the money to help her daughter, the mother getting mad at her son for losing the money to her, her son's friend, mm -hmm. took off with the money, and yet the and yet the husband not leaving the house or demanding that his pregnant wife go with him 
they stayed together, even though there was conflict between the two. There was always conflict among each other. The husband yeah. and the, the husband and the wife and the baby comes along. The news of the baby. She didn't tell him in the beginning. Uh, <laughs> the daughter who wanted to go to school but had the boyfriend, and right. was not even confused about the boyfriend. He was just there. He was helpful, but he was not of them. He was not black of them. He was so different. And then the memory of the husband who died, I yeah. think, I think is, is part of that picture. Yeah. Because the mother wants to honor his memory. And with the money that she has as the gift, if, if, you, if you want to look at that uh, widow's pension, uh, she wanted to make sure that she honored him and his memory by using the money wisely for, right. her, for her. So I think everyone is good and everyone is bad. Everyone has ex uh, difficulties with personal relations. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, girlfriend, boyfriend, mother, children. That's life. That is life. That's, that's what we all go through ourselves. Mm. Uh, although I think that the symbol of the struggle is the house that the mother wants to move to. Yeah. She did a yeah. really good job of setting that as the, almost the protagonist, you know, that is yeah. the answer. Yeah. 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 You I, guys. Well, go ahead. I would, like to, I would mm -hmm. just like to give my script. Please. If I may. Of course. <laughs> You know, I I lived in those days that all of this has occurred in her life. And of course, mine was not, my life was not a part of upper class, middle class people. My lifestyle came out of lower, the lower class people who really lived in bad condition. And the alcohol had played a real big problem in families, even at that time. Yes. And I had I, I kind of I kind of sense that even though it was two different classes, the upper and the lower they had the same kind of problems. Yeah. Housing, wanting better things for, and I know for myself, my dad, we were picking cotton when we came to Arizona. And my dad would always say, I want you to have the best way. And that is, I'm looking for a school for you. And yet there was no school for us. Mm. The farmers wanted us to pick cotton. That's why right. there was no. <laughs> right. So, so all of us have gone through what Lorraine has described in this beautiful play. Beautiful, yes. So true. We've all had a piece of it. There have been so many wonderful comments that have come out from what you guys have said. I'm so glad that you're seeing the personal connection. Um, I want to go back to a point about the 1950s. And Miss Ruth, you had talked about it, how when we think of the 1950s, Elvis, um, the poodle skirts, the blue um, and the pink <laughs> skirts with the um, those cute shoes. I love those. What are those called? Those cute little black saddle, 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 saddle shoes. Oh, so cute. And the saddle, saddle shoes. Foot. Yeah. And the pedophores under them to make them move. Yeah. I still love watching Happy Days. <laughs> I still love that show. Um, yeah, yes, however, but you know, the 50s is Doris Day. Doris Day. And who right? else? Rock uh, Hudson. Yeah. Uh, James yeah. James Dean. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Elvis. Marlon Brando. Right. The tough guys. So we do see those conditions in those kinds of plays of young white males, young white females. But you see Doris Day who becomes the object of maybe little girls not like me or my friends or growing up in the Mexican community. But mm -hmm. Doris Day becomes the symbol of white women who want to be like Doris Day. 
and black women and black women girls, and latinx and, yes right uh -huh, because that was what we thought that yes we, you want to to ascend to yes so hansberry's play she's mm -hmm. kind of dark here like tara said when she prefaced it weariness was everywhere mm -hmm. i mean that doesn't sound like happy days <laughs> happy days home mm -hmm. you know she's talking about dreams deferred and bringing things to light I think she was really courageous for her time to have written this play as a woman. And I'm so proud of her that she stood for what she believed in and wrote that, that play. I mean, that took a lot of guts. Um, that would be an innovative play now. I mean, it if would she be. That today, mm -hmm. okay, we're looking with the Supreme court hearing and everything that's going on with that, like with the confirmation okay. hearings, mm -hmm. that would be a, that would be um, relevant. And as, as, controversial today absolutely mm -hmm. absolutely before we move on i love langston hughes so i gotta just a little bit more on his on his um poem what happens to a dream deferred does it dry up like a raisin in the sun we all know what a raisin looks like when it's a raisin in the sun i'm thinking my mom used to have grape vines in the backyard and when they would dry up they'd be real yucky mm -hmm. but does it fester like a sore and then run. We've all had a sore that has pus coming out of it and runs, right? Mm -hmm. Yucky and nasty. Does it stink like rotten meat? We've smelled that. That's mm -hmm. horrible. Or crust and sugar over like a syrup sweet? Like something just, uh, I think of just uh, when things spoil and like a syrup comes over them and it's just hard. Or maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode you know when your dreams are in you and they're they're not coming to fruition it hurts and i think that the people in the play they're hurt just like joanne said the the brother um and the way he treats and talks to his wife he's hurting inside and um they're in these crammed up situation where there's no place to move. I think Tara, you brought that or mentioned that or one of us did. Well, because of the description of the house, it's a crowded, uh, the furniture may not be modern or new. It's weary. Uh, it's not beautiful. It's yeah. hard. You got to share the bathroom. Yeah. The, the, car the carpet may not be the best. That's just uh, not the best it, environment. It, it's just so many people living in one room and then Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's just crowded crowded being crowded but i think in a working class neighborhood if you're living in that kind of a situation i know many people did that it isn't that you get used to the crowdedness you learn how to live within the crowdedness mm -hmm. uh, because there are others who are worse off than you who don't have hot water in the house or a, or a bathroom inside the home but how does that defer a dream if Mama's dream was for them to get out of that situation. Right, mm -hmm. right, right. And um, so that she knew that there could be a better life mm -hmm. for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that's my first question. Why do you think all the scenes in this play take place in the family's home? Well, where else would it take place? They didn't go outside. They didn't go anywhere right. else. What was the purpose of that? What do you guys think? I being together, I, being, being together in that house where everyone is in the same room, they're themselves, and they can be themselves because they're with family, regardless of the age of the children, the difference in relationships between husband and wife, who live their life in front of, in front of their siblings, husband mm -hmm. and wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, what kind of privacy is that sometimes? None. There's no privacy. That's. I think that's another point that she tried mm -hmm. to make describing the conditions of the house there's no privacy but i think that even though they had the conditions of the house they were safer in the house mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially the the young boy he had to be home by a certain time and when the husband was not in the house he was out in the street in the bars drinking and possibly having an affair mm -hmm. so uh it's like a two, the house was like a two edged sword. Yeah. So. Good, good, um, good. Tara, what do you think? Hmm. You were going to say something? I think that the 
what, what I agree with everything that's been said, but there's just a certain authenticity when you get to see behind the scenes uh, their inner battle. They didn't have to pretend to be brave. They're just frustrated. Everybody's frustrated. Everybody's weary. Everybody's mm-hmm. battling. And you get to see that better in their house. Uh, I, I like to say that my family and I live that kind of life. And I don't even think we thought about a dream. We just hoped that one day mm-hmm. we would have a better place to live. Mm-hmm. But as far as us being concerned about each other, it was just that we had to do it. We had to get in there and we had to do the things that all of us would get a chance to participate. Right. If it was taking a bath, it went down the line with the baby and then it goes up in the tub of water or whatever we had to do. But it was family. And I think we lived without being too frustrated with the condition. That's great, great. I think um, I agree with everything that has been said. I think it just makes the play more rich when we can see the authentic authenticity, as Tara said, of the way they live. Chris, well, where else would it play, take place? I, I have a question, Professor. Sure. Uh, regarding regarding the husband who yeah. didn't like the type of work that he had because it was boring, he said. He was a chauffeur. Here he is, Walter Younger, 35 years old. Yeah, he was a chauffeur. And I'm wondering, in this kind of a neighborhood, in this kind of an atmosphere in the 50s, being a chauffeur, I think, is an important job. It may not, it wasn't said how much money he was making, but he wasn't working a laborer. He wasn't uh, begging for food. He wasn't on the street looking for cigars or cigarettes to pick up and smoke. He wasn't poor in that kind of a way. He Can you had find a, that, that part in the play? Let's read it. Uh, he mentioned he was a chauffeur. He no, I mean the part of his um because no, i'll try to find it too but if you can find it um i didn't write the page number oh okay let me sorry see keep talking and and he quit i i never understood why he quit or why he just stopped not not going to work i, I didn't get that part why he just quit was he bored i don't know i think he just had a lot of frustration uh-huh i'll try to find it does anyone have any thought i mean we can speculate yeah well, i'm just, I... just curious it's I don't know if this is in line with what you're saying, but I can describe. I found it. (laughs) Go ahead. I I can describe what was going on in our family at that time. My personal family is that my husband didn't like his job either, but that meant that all Blacks had an evening job. They had a from four, from three to three, three to uh, 12 o'clock. They had no identity with their family at all. Mm. Oh, here, because of the length of time he was working? Is that what you mean? Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. He was never home, in other words, is that what you're saying? Well, home we, during family time. Oh, 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 okay. Not a time to spend with his children. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I guess my question was, was being a chauffeur that bad of a job to have? Go to page 73, and then we'll, let's think about it. It's not about being a chauffeur chauffeur that was bothering him. There were other things. Page 73. Yeah, okay. I, uh, when I read this, this passage about uh, his feelings about being a chauffeur, it made me think of uh, some, and I can't even think of the name of the show now, but it's where the, the, the black people in the, or the black men in the show, yes, sir, 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And yeah. When, when, That's what I was going to get to. Uh-huh. 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 And, uh-huh. And when I read that, it, I thought that he felt like he was still, even though he they were not slaves, but yeah. he felt almost like in a capacity oh. that a slave oh. oh, I get it. Thank you. you. Okay. You got it. Page 73. Oh. Let's read it. Page 73. Okay. All right. Oh, says, I get it now. Page 73. On page 73, um, starting from the middle of the page, Mama, yes, Mama says, yes, son. And then Walter says, I want so many things that are driving me kind of crazy. Mama, look at me. And Mama says, I'm looking at you. You a good looking boy. You got a job, a nice wife, a fine boy. And, and he says, a job, Mama, a job. I open and close doors all day long. I drive a man around in his limousine and I say, yes, sir. No, sir. Very good, sir. Shall I go the drive, sir? Shall I take the drive, sir? Mama, that ain't no kind of job. That ain't nothing at all. Mama, I don't know if I can make you understand. Understand what, baby? Sometimes it's like I can see the future stretched out in front of me, just plain as day. The future, mama, hanging over there at the edge of my days, just waiting for me. A big looming blank space full of nothing, just waiting for me. But I don't have, but it don't have to be. He pauses and kneels beside her chair. Mama, sometimes when I'm downtown and I pass them cool, quiet looking restaurants where the white boys are sitting back and talking about things, sitting there turning deals worth millions of dollars. Sometimes I see guys that don't look much older than me. Son, how can you talk so much about money with immense passion? Because it is life, Mama. He saw just what jo- um, mm-hmm. Joanne said. It's mm-hmm. he saw himself as nothing. He's riding this man around. Yes sir, no sir. Anything mm-hmm. else, sir? Just cow towing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. Mm-hmm. Thank you for that excellent question. We can take it back to the text. Mm-hmm. Thank so, you, Joanne. Thank you, Joanne. Oh, you're welcome. So this mm-hmm. is Walter Younger. We're going to look at some pictures, and I had to bring these in. Sydney Portier there. Oops, these are the children. Beneath the younger, who was 20, that's the younger sister. We talked about her. And then we have Ruth Younger, Ruby D, beautiful Ruby D, mm. wife. Mm-hmm. And then little Travis, their son, mm-hmm. little 11 year old boy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So my question is about the younger children and family. How is Beneath different from the other younger family members? What made her a little bit different? She was going to school. Yep, she was going to school. Mm-hmm. What else made her different? I think uh, in addition to going to school, she was able to dream and see herself in another situation other than where the family was at that time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And she was also uh, going to school to try and do that. Whereas the husband, all he saw himself doing was driving that car and yes, sir, no, sir. It didn't ever say anything about him thinking about how to better himself other than dealing with those people in the street. The right. Will, Willie and those guys, and those guys weren't weren't d- dreaming about becoming better citizens. Right, right. But, but wasn't Benita wanting to go to school to be a nurse? Did yeah, I, I, said, I said she was uh, going to school. Um, yeah. I didn't say that. what she was going. I thought she said she wanted to be a doctor. Oh, a doctor. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. But uh, if we look at her career choice and her dream of becoming a doctor, there, there right there is a, a, a problem that Hansberry probably suggests is how realistic well, it's good that she wants to be a doctor, but how many black doctors are there are going to be working in a hospital uh, despite the segregation that, that occurs? Uh, the young girl has a dream. She wants to be a doctor, Hansberry says, but how many black doctors are there going to be in the life that we can see is going to be better? I don't know. I'm just curious. One is better than none. And I am so happy yeah. that she had a dream. And that she was different in that she believed and she um, was cultured. You know, she had these different boyfriends uh-huh. and uh-huh. Her brother just didn't see anything beyond the streets as um, Joanne saying, go ahead, Joanne. And if, if she didn't have the dream, uh, she would never uh, 
move move ahead. You know, she oh. might become a doctor, but with her having a dream, it meant that she saw herself be something more than what she was or what her relatives had been. It mm -hmm. was like, it, it was a way for her to dream and think big. Mm -hmm. she, might, she might not get to the top, but if you think down uh, at 20% instead of at 80%, wh what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. On page 67, she um, said she wanted to be the queen of the Nile. She believed this girl had a lot of dreams in her when she was um, playing with the Nigerian dress. And, um, mm -hmm. and she told her mama um, that... Uh, where was it? Okay, Mama, actually on 66, Mama coming back into the room. She's resting now, Travis, baby. Run next door and ask Miss Johnson to please let me have a little kitchen cleanser. This here can, can is empty as Jacob's kettle. Travis, I just came in. Mama, do as you told. He exits and looks at her daughter. Where are you going? To become a queen of the Nile. She was <laughs> just, you know, <laughs> but I love that, you know. She had these <laughs> hopes and these dreams. They probably were just like, oh, this girl again. But, I love that yes, but don't, don't you think uh, you, you have to think big? Or you're not going to get it. If you don't believe, right. think, you're not going to have it. Right, right. And, and she might not reach the doctor's status, but if, if she started off thinking she was going to be a nurse, uh, uh, what is it, nurse's aid or aid. something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Then where is she going to go? Mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and I think that was the problem with the uh, with Walter. Yeah, he he couldn't see himself doing anything other than trying to make money and and I don't know exactly how to explain it, but um, what he was thinking about was we used to call them city slickers, mm -hmm. where you know. <laughs> The, uh, he's going to go out here and he's going to make all this money, but they turn in deals, tricks and stuff. And, and one is outsmart another. And what did his friend do? He gave him the money and the friend took off. Yeah. You know, uh, he needed, a, he needed a different type of dream, I think. Yes. Agreed. Where he was dealing with people with, with higher I ideas about what they wanted to do in life then trick people out of money. Exactly. Thank you. We've talked about the strains on Walter and Ruth's marriage. Um, I want to get back to Benita. She said, and I have the page. Um, page. Did it go? 104. I'll start from um, Mama. Mama, I'm old and corrupted. Benita enters. You was rude to Miss Johnson, Benita, and I don't like it at all. Benita, Mama, if there are two things we as people have to get to overcome, one's the Ku Klux Klan and the other is Mrs. Johnson, and she exits. <laughs> what do you think she means by that? <laughs> that's, yes. that's life. <laughs> that's I life. think she was really going over the fact that she had learned a better way of life Mm -hmm. And nobody was fitting her her way of thinking mm -hmm. about love, and especially the Ku Klux Klan would be against everybody, and then she would probably want to be a better person. But there was no way she could be that way because of what the, what was going on in this area or the conditions that were there at that time right. but most people would have said when she came from the college with all of those ideas here comes that college girl and mm. she knows everything mm -hmm. you know okay. and that, that's what mama was trying to say is that she was not trying to listen to what she had been taught but what she was now learning. Mm -hmm. Benita, all that. Mm -hmm. um, on, on page 102, yes. On, on page 102, um, Mama and Miss, Miss Johnson is talking, and down at the bottom, 
Ms. Johnson says, I know, but sometimes she acts like ain't got time to pass the time of day with nobody ain't been to college. Mm. Oh, I ain't criticizing her none. It's just, you know how some of our young people gets when they get a little education. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Mama and Ruth say nothing, just look at her. Yes, well, well, I guess I better get on home because I can understand how she must be proud and everything, being the only one in the family to make something of herself. I know just how being a chauffeur ain't never satisfied brother none. Mm -hmm. Didn't feel like that though. Ain't nothing wrong with being a chauffeur. So when she said that, uh, yeah. that yeah. about getting rid of uh, two things we as a people oh, have yeah. to, get over, yeah. to overcome, overcome. overcome. Uh, yep. is the Ku Klux Klan and the other is Mrs. Johnson. If Mrs. Johnson had her way, she uh, she wouldn't have been going to college to get an a education and move higher. There you and, go. And the son would remain a chauffeur. Because mm -hmm. she said there's nothing wrong with that job. Right, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and that would keep them in their place, just yeah. like the Ku Klux Klan had been trying to keep them in their place and and uh, for years. So, <laughs> yeah, she was not progressive, and she didn't want them to progress. Excellent, mm -hmm. excellent, excellent. Good, yeah. She was very mm -hmm. satisfied with her life now. Mm -hmm. She doesn't care about moving on. Mm -hmm. right. Now let's go on to Mama. Mama was sixty-five years old. I love, I love her. <laughs> Why do you think mama's little plant is so important to her? And what do you think she means when she said it expresses me? <laughs> do you know what page that was on? Let Where me get that. I was going to get it. Uh, be because, because it's her, it's her life. She gave it birth, this little plant. She watered it. She took care of it. She knew how to make it live. And it was like her, strong, sturdy, uh -huh. uh, beautiful in a different way. It could withstand anything. It grew. It grew. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it grew. <laughs> yeah. It was life. It was life. Yeah. And I think for Mama, all of those things are, are true and correct. But I think also getting that house, that was what Mama had grown up with as being... Um, a sign of you made it, prosperity, you doing well for your family. And at 65, she probably was not thinking or able to dream and think about going to college like yeah. her, her daughter could. Mm -hmm. But in her mind, it was, a, it was a step up into society. Right. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Anyone else? And she was gonna take her plant with her and her plant was going to live. Yeah. That oh, was, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. her important possession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think you guys hit on that really well. I, mm -hmm. I think that um, writers like Hansberry, any symbolism that they have in there, it has a reason. Um, she didn't just put it in there haphazardly. She truly thought about it. Um, well, maybe, maybe the plant was like Hansberry. Mm, could be. You know. There's been some critique on that. Mm -hmm. But Hansberry had her challenges. Um, she was criticized, you know, she critiqued traditional sex roles in this play. Benita was not trying to go and be a nurse. She wanted to be a doctor. She, um, we had strong black women portrayed in here. Um, remember we talked about her being a supporter of the lesbian movement. Um, how does she challenge stereotypes in this play? We already read a perfect example with Benita, the one talking about who we need to um, overcome as a Ku Klux Klan and people like Miss Johnson. Any other examples of that, of how she challenged stereotypes um, in this play? That was a big part for those characters to play. Mm -hmm. The Ku Klux Klan played their role, and so did Miss Johnson. Mm -hmm. And she knew, she knew how far she could go with that. Right, right. Well, I'm thinking of the, the 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 people who went to the play. Who would they be going to Broadway to see a play? They would be upper class white people. They would be white people who knew nothing about 
Negroes or African Americans or Blacks, according to the wordage that was used at the time. They had their own stereotypes. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think for Hansberry, challenging their stereotypes of her people in the play to give them something to think about that, yes, Negroes using that word had dreams. Yes, there were daughters who wanted to become doctors. Yes, there were sons who challenged the matriarchs, the matriarch in the family by wanting to do something different and not go along with what mama wanted. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think Hansberry was using stereotypes to tell white people, not thinking herself that they were only going to, that they were the only ones who are going to see the play, but she was challenging stereotypes that she knew she encountered even though she was not from the low class or the working class, even though she had an education and many didn't, even though she was a writer and could express herself and others couldn't, even though she had a father who was well-to-do, even though she had family that lived among whites, I think she was bringing out stereotypes that she herself knew, even though she didn't live them. Mm -hmm. And she was using them to show and I'm talking about the white audience, the differences between her, her, not saying so much about her being different or better, but just saying to them, I am like them. Mm -hmm. They are me and I am they. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Tara? Oh, I can't hear you. Sorry. You're on mute. And then, we'll, the no, I agree with everything that everyone's yeah. saying, anything new there. Thank you. Okay, let's go to page 121 because um, someone had asked me about it earlier. The plant, I found it. Um, Benita asked her, laughingly notice, I'm on 121. Benita, laughingly noticing what her mother is doing. Mama, what are you doing? Mama, fixing my plant so it won't get hurt none on the way. Benita, Mama, you gonna take that to the new house? Mama, mm-hmm. Benita, that raggedy looking old thing. Mama stopped and looking at her. It expresses me. She's taking her plant with her. Yes, it was coming to the new house. It's hers. It's it's her. So, and excellent points about the challenging of the stereotypes. I think she did it throughout the book with these beautiful, strong women. Um, the person in the play who seemed the weakest, I'm sorry, was brother. The way he was acting and acting up. I mean, the women had to kind of pull him together. So mm -hmm. she did a good way of showing the strong black woman, which we know we are. Mm -hmm. Now, I, how I wanted to say, um, I'm sitting in a room with five plants. So I'm oh, good. there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Love your plants too. <laughs> Let's connect it to today's world. We're just about done. And we we've done a really good discussion tonight. This is great. The play was written and produced. This play was written and produced and Tara kind of brought this up over 60 years ago. Um, to what extent do you think, think that the conflicts and issues presented in the play are still relevant today? How is Hansberry they're still? All, I have to laugh because they are most all of them are relevant today. Mm -hmm. It's some that are hidden mm -hmm. and there's some silence that are not being spoken about. Mm -hmm. But most of them, those things that she described gave that white person a way to deal with black folks. Yeah, yes. The yeah. way I see it. That's because if they didn't know how we were living or how our, our, how our families were, how could they deal with us? Yes. And they're always a step ahead of us mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Yes, Ms. Ruth, I totally agree. They all, all of her themes could be relevant in today's world. Anyone else? Those uh, I think that question about money has to come into play here and there's kind of a discussion about what's relevant then and today. Uh, things that people do when they have money or think they're gonna have money or want money or get money uh, money may be the dream in this example in this play uh, 
But then there are other stories about money that show people acting um, differently when there's money. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what would have, what would the son have done with money? I mean, we know what happened, but would he have been successful? We'll know. The only one that we know who's going to be the beneficiary of the money is mama. Because it's the mama who's going to make everyone better by moving into the white neighborhood. Even though there's going to be problems, uh, it's the money that mama uses that makes everything better. Mm. So in this case, money is good because it's mama who's going to use it for good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know. Good. No, thank you. What uh, about housing? I have, I have a question. And yeah, I don't really know how to ask it because I can't find where it first showed up in the book. But what do you think about Benita's uh, boyfriend, Asagi? Asagi. Uh -huh. Asagi, yeah. Yeah. The boyfriend? Uh huh. What do we think of him in what way? And, and uh, how he was raised and how, what he. How he fit into the situation that she was living in mm -hmm. compared to how he he lived in uh, Africa. Before. I'm going to give that one to Tara. Well, he wanted to take her back home to him, to his country. He didn't right. want to be, he didn't want to live Tara, with mama. He, you know, he wanted, to, he wanted to move. Let Tara speak to this one. Go ahead, Tara. She and I have a understanding of this one. Yeah, I think that there's this uh, fairy tale, sweep me away kind of thing that maybe was very seductive about being considered a princess, considered a person who'd be treated with such such glory. Um, I think that it, it 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 caused her to maybe have rose colored glasses about who he was and how he was represented in the story. There are layers to it, I think, of, of fairy tale that being more of a fairy tale than a reality which also is another, one minute, baby, which also become, could contextually be another character in the story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So much could be said about that. Um, I have personal experience with that, but we, there's no time for that tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, whoops, we're going to move on. Our next book. We're going to move on to our next book. We're done with this one. It was just a short play. I wanted us to read this one. We're going to read some Terry McMillan. We're going to read, it's not all downhill from here. We're going to read about some ladies um, of a young age. They're, they're not teenagers, but they're some mature ladies and they're going to teach us about life and um, let's do something a little bit more modern. So Terry McMillan, and we all love her, I hope. I mean, I've read her books over the years and really enjoyed them. And I thought she could use some love too. Let's put her into the book club. So our next book club meeting, if it will work, will be April the 28th at 6 p.m. And I think we can stop recording now. So I thank everyone for um, their participation this evening.